And so I'm so glad again to have all of you here. Now, I love Easter time. It's so much fun, but I'm gonna, I have to admit something. Easter was a little more fun when the kids were little. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, it was so much fun. And so the best part about Easter, of course, the whole day is, of course, what? It's the, it's the Easter egg hunt, right? I mean, you guys, it's amazing. You know, you're like, yeah, the miracle of Easter. It is a miracle, right? That kids can find 45 eggs in 30 seconds, but can't clean their room in two hours. <laughs> it's a miracle, right? I mean, it's, right? I mean, how many guys with me? So I love the Easter egg hunt. It's so much fun. Now, I remember when the kids were little, we used to film all these things. I, I realized I was going to show you one. I can't bring a single one to you because they're too violent. <laughs> how many guys know what I'm talking about? Like, I remember back in the day when, when Mason was like eight or nine, okay, he's now working at the Stone Oak Campus. Hi, Mason, I'm telling on you today. So he was eight or nine. Cole was like six. And Sophie, they're both in, in, in church here. And Sophie was three. Sophie was so cute, little chubby, just squeeze her cheek. And so she was so cute. And so we would always, this is what we do. You do this too with the little one. You're like, you release them first. Like, hey, go, go get some eggs. But they're so slow. Sophie's like, there's the egg. And then like, about the time she takes one step towards it, two boys just tackle each other and grab it. <laughs> right? So the only way that your little one gets the egg is you're like, hey, Sophie, over here. Look, there's a new, there's an egg right there. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. That's how you have to do it, right? You have to drop them, right? I mean, you're like, and so because the boy, it was so violent. I, I'm not kidding. Like it's, it's like the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or Hunger Games. I mean, children are dying trying to get these eggs. It's, it's, it's very aggressive. Anyways, but yeah, that's like, that's the whole thing. They love the eggs. But of course, everyone knows the one, the egg you want the most is what? Golden. It's the golden egg, right? More on that in a minute, but we always want the golden egg. So I want to show you a couple of scripture here. You know, as much as I love Easter bunnies and Easter eggs and all that's great. The real reason we're here is not any of that. It's because our Savior rose again from the grave. That's the reason we celebrate. In fact, look what the Apostle Paul said about this in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, if, he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is worth nothing and your faith is worth nothing. I want to bring this up because some people say, yeah, you know, I come to Easter because my family invites me and I love God. I believe that there's a God and I believe in good. But the whole Jesus rose again from the grave. I mean, that's a little much. But if you take that out, our faith is useless. I mean, honestly, if Christ didn't really rise again. We're wasting our time. We can just go home right now. We'll just call it. But if he did raise a new life, it changes everything. And so, but he was clear. The apostle Paul said, if that didn't happen, then we got nothing. If it did happen, then we got everything. I mean, it's really that clear. It's, it's really that simple. So what happened? Well, let's look at the eyewitness account. Now, before I, I quote the scripture from Luke chapter uh, 24, before I quote it, it's easy for a skeptic to say, oh, well, that's in the Bible. And I don't believe the Bible. Well, that's because you may think the Bible got to you like, like someone just hands you a book. Like, Here it is, like one person wrote this book. That's not how we got the Bible. The Bible is many eyewitness accounts of God's miraculous movement and then in the New Testament, it's eyewitness accounts of people seeing Jesus walk and talk and heal people and do all kinds of crazy stuff, including rise again. And so this is an eyewitness account. Luke went home and he wrote this stuff down. And so, and you and I had the benefit of seeing what was written down. So check out Luke chapter 24. This is what it says. This is the eyewitness account of Sunday morning over 2,000 years ago that we celebrate today. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, before we go any further, I just want to stop here. If you believe this whole thing's made up, I just need to let you in on something. If you don't think it's real, I'm glad you're here. I love talking to skeptics, especially if you call yourself an atheist, you are way closer to becoming a Christian than you realize because you've actually labeled yourself. Most people don't even do that. So if you're calling yourself that, awesome, you're actually really close to finding God. I actually call atheists pre-Christians. <laughs> so, if you're like, okay, I think that whole thing was written, it was made up, but here's the thing you need to know. If you are in ancient Israel at the time of this writing, if you wanted to lend credibility to your story, you wouldn't lead with two women finding it, finding the empty tomb. And you know why? Because women did not have credibility back in their day. I'm not insulting, I'm not saying it's right, I'm just telling you that's the way it was. Women couldn't even own property back then. So actually, if you're gonna make up a story like this, like, hey, let's write this real story and let's make people really believe Jesus rose again, then you would be like, uh, emperor so-and-so walked in and Jesus was gone. You wouldn't say to women. Now, I believe that this tells me this story is authentic because they're just telling you how it happened. But I also believe that God is validating women saying, you are a joint heir of the grace of God. 
and I have a place for you in the kingdom. And so ladies, just know that God knew before the foundations of the world put in place that he wanted these two women to be the first to find that Christ rose again. So I just want you to know you're validated right here in Scripture. God is saying, I love you, believe in you, and you're joint heirs of all that I have in this world. Isn't that good to know? I just want to encourage you with that. Now, if, if you don't mind me indulging on one more thing I want to point out. You know, isn't it interesting that the women find Christ rose again first? And I want to just say this. Most of the time in our families, women are activated in their faith first. Many times women, moms and, 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 and wives are the first to come to Christ. And this can be difficult though, if you're like, yeah, I'm, I had to drag my spouse here or drag my kids here, I, I, I'm really into this and they're not so into this and so I'm not trying to make it like an awkward moment here, but I just want to say this, that my father was not into it either. My mom was a Christian way before he was and she would wake up on Sunday mornings and say, hey honey, you wanna to go to church with us? I'm gonna take the kids. And he would always say, no, I don't wanna go. No, no, that's not me. I don't, I don't believe in all that. You, you go ahead. Like he was always respectful towards her, but like, yeah, you go ahead, honey. I'm, I'm going to stay here. And he'd sleep in. And this happened year after year after year. And I really, the reason women oftentimes come to God first is because you're more relational. So you're more open to a relationship with God. And so men typically are not as relational. But my mom was faithful, loved God, and taught us about the Lord. And she didn't preach at my dad. She didn't judge my dad. She just simply loved him and stayed faithful. And over time, eventually, God got a hold of my dad's heart, and he is radically saved ever since, and he's a godly man. That's all I've ever known is a godly father. It was because my mother was faithful. So I just, I want to encourage you, if you have a loved one that's not quite where you're at with God, it's okay. Give it time. You're just the first to discover that Christ rose, but eventually they'll discover it too. So let's jump back in the scripture. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women went, were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why, what are you looking, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here, he is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. So basically the angels said to Mary, uh, it basically said, hey, uh, Jesus is exactly what he said he's going to do. He did. He's not here. And so they're like, we, we came to, you know, basically to honor him. And, you know, basically they, to tend to his, they, they love him so much we're going to tend to his dead body. And, and they were like, he's not here. He's risen. And so, but I think it's funny that they said, yeah, just like he said he's going to, because he did, he said it over and over again. This is a funny thing. You look at it, you study it, Jesus talk about, I'm the resurrection and the life. You're like, yeah. And they didn't quite clue into the whole, wait, you said resurrection. What, what does that mean? Like you're going to come back to life? Like he said openly, he's like, yeah, I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to come back. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we know. I mean, you're like Elijah and Elijah died. Now you're here. So it's like, you know, yeah, you're, and he's like, no, that's not what I mean. It means I'm going to die and I'm going to raise again. Oh, okay. You mean like the temple's going to be torn down. And it's going to be rebuilt. And he's like, no, I mean, I'm going to die. And I'm going to like, dude, how many times do I have to say this? They didn't get it because it sounded crazy. Like, what? He's like, yeah, I'm going to die for your sins and I'm going to come back to life. They're like, okay, Jesus, that sounds a little crazy. And for those of you who think, well, you know, I, that's the thing about Jesus. I think he was a great teacher, but that's it. But did you have a great professor like in college? I had a couple that were really good. Maybe a really amazing teacher in high school that you really loved, you're inspired by them. Like the only reason you like liked school is that one class. They're like, oh yeah, that was really cool. And they really inspired you. They probably were really great, but I bet they never said, oh, by the way, I'm the Messiah. You'd be like, nah, you're crazy. <laughs> right? Like you can't, you, can't, you can't claim that and be a good teacher. That's insane. Either you are or you aren't. Like he's like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm God. Like you'd be like, yeah. That's, that's when you're losing it, right? If I ever say that at our church, just head on out. Just go ahead and just go, right? Like, just like, he called himself God. We're out. We're just, yeah, no. Nope. And so that's like, he's either the Lord or he's a liar or he's a lunatic. So it's one or the other. You can't be a great teacher and say you're God. You either are God or you're not. And he said, I am the Messiah and I'm going to die and I'm going to raise again. And then he did it, which is crazy. So if you're taking notes, would you write this down? The first thing is our entire faith comes down to one event. It either happened or it didn't. The second thing I want to encourage you to write down is that the tomb was empty. There was no decayed body to be found because Jesus rose again from the grave. Did you know that, by the way, that, um, that when famous people die, we memorialize them? Think about that. Like Kobe Bryant passed away, you know, and, and guess what? There's, there's a memorial for him out in L.A. because he's a big deal to a lot of people. He inspired a lot of people with his basketball, you know, and so, you know, he's famous. 
But even more than famous, let's talk about world-changing people. Like fame, fame is great, and there's a lot of celebrities that, you know, have nice tombs. But world-changing, like history-changing people, let me just show you a couple of memorials. This is George Washington's. It's really beautiful, isn't it? And we memorialize him. Why? Because he, he's, he, was, he was the first president. He fought for our nation to have our freedom, right? And so he's a big deal. Plus, one of the greatest things he did is what he didn't do. He didn't continue on to say, my kid's going to be the next president, basically turning himself into a king. He didn't do that. He said, no, someone else should take over after me. And so we have this thing called democracy, right? And so here's another very famous tomb that we memorialize for good reason. And this is, uh, this is uh, Abraham Lincoln. And, and he gave, you know, his, his freedom. I mean, he died for us. I mean, he didn't, he didn't mean to die, but, you know, he was killed because of what he did. Why? He set the slaves free. He set the captives free. And so many people would argue that he's probably the greatest president we ever had. I mean, many people argue that. So he actually has two memorials. One is in D.C. If you've ever seen it, it's amazing. But the second one, this is where he's actually buried. The reason I want to point that out is here's two, two men that changed the world, or at least our world here in America, and um, they're both memorialized wherever they're buried. So where is Christ's memorial? We, we, we don't have one because he rose again. There's no grave because he's not in the grave. Does that make sense? So, you remember going to Sunday school? How many of you guys went to Sunday school growing up? I did. You know, the only thing that's frustrating about Sunday school is like, when do I graduate? When do I get the degree? I don't know when this happens. You know? So I grew up going to Sunday school. There was a little boy named Johnny. He went to Sunday school. Uh, and, and the teacher this particular day said, hey, next week is Easter. So everyone bring back something that represents new life, right? Go ask your parents. They'll help you with it. So all the kids go home, tell them about Sunday school that day. And then they come back the next week and like, you know, a little girl walked in. She's like, she had a flower and she's like put up on the teacher's little podium there, and it's like, okay, so a flower represents new life, and another little, little boy brought some grass, you know, and they're like, yeah, that represents new life. No, actual grass. Let me be real clear. Actual grass. <laughs> That'd be a really bad Sunday school if you brought grass to Sunday school. So, and then another person brought a picture, you know, like of a little newborn puppy, you know, like, oh, this is my, right, this is my, my newborn puppy represents new life. And then Johnny brought an egg, and they were like, okay, you know, like, we know Easter and Easter eggs, but but so the teacher says, oh, what, what's the egg for? And then she opened it, and, and it was empty, and everyone kind of snickered, like, well, there's not even anything in the egg, right? But then when it opened, he said, no, 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 it's, it's what's not in it. It it's represents the empty tomb. Maybe we should start looking at eggs differently from now on, right? Like, it's, it's, it's not what's in it. It's what's not in it. That's so powerful. Amen. That Christ is not in the tomb. It's a game changer. This, this one thing changed everything. He really rose again. Now, now again, you may say, okay, hold on. But they, they could have just stolen the body and hid it somewhere. And then, you know, like said, he rose again and he's our savior. And he's not, you know, and they're like, well, where is he? Well, you know, we saw him, but we you know where he is now. But that didn't happen like that, did it? And so, in fact, by the way, you know, Israel was an occupied country. And just, just to give you an understanding of what that looks like, uh, if, if Germany would have won World War II, we'd all be speaking German. I mean, we probably still have America, but there'd be German occupiers here that they'd have some leader that would be our, the head, the potentate or whatever. We'd all be speaking German and we would all just have to like, you know, bow to them and then you'll hopefully live our lives in peace, right? That's what Israel was doing. Rome had taken over. And so they had these Roman authorities. And now all this, there's this, all, all this upheaval because even Jewish people are upset because they're in Israel and they're like, you can't be more Jewish than Israel, right? That's the, the birthplace of every Jew, right? I mean, and so, and they're all, did you know it was such a big deal when Jesus rose again that they used to celebrate Passover for 2,000 years? You, anyone know any Jewish people? They're extremely traditional people. Like they, I mean, every year they celebrate these, these, these marks uh, along the Jewish calendar. It's like a big thing. So what would have to happen for the Passover to traditionally be celebrated every year in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the heart of Israel, and all of a sudden the next year they start celebrating Easter? What kind of event would make them change their 2,000-year-old calendar? It had to be a world-changing moment. It was. Christ rose again. It was, it was the game-changer move of, of all <laughs> game-changer moves that happened in, in that way. So th the reason I want to bring this up is because... This wasn't done in secret. Pe people saw that, that Christ rose again. And in fact, um, the empty tomb was the game changing move. But if I'm Rome, if I'm, if I'm in charge and I'm in Israel and I'm like one of the potentates or the leaders or governors, whatever you want to call me, and I'm getting tired of hearing people talking about, oh, Jesus is Lord and he's the man and this is all, I'd be like, okay, you know what? Just shut up. Okay, someone go over there and dig up that dead body, bring it over here, let's hang it up on a post. And everybody say, that's your God, there's your God. So shut up about this Jesus crap. There he is, he's dead. 
They couldn't do that. Not only could they not do it because he he didn't have the body, here's the other problem. He was walking around talking to people. It's like, yeah, we're trying to figure out how to shut those Jesus down. Who's that guy with these Jesus? Whoa, that's Jesus. That's the guy that we just buried him. What? And there he is walking around. He's walking around. He's talking to people. He's interacting with people. And so you talk about a problem. Not only do they have an empty tomb, they got a guy walking around. He's like, yeah, I'm Jesus. Here, oh, you want to see the nail scarred hands? There they are. People touched him. People ate with him. People talked with him. People interacted with him. And so they had a real problem in their hands. We can't shut this down. This is why it changed the world. It went viral. It really did. In fact, it went so viral. I want to show you something Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. I passed on to you what was most important and what, you had, and what had already been passed on to me. So Paul's like, now he's about to quote some, some, some scripture. He's about to quote some theology, some teaching, some, something they believed in. But this is not originally from Paul. Paul's not saying, hey, I want to tell you this. He's saying, I want to tell you what's been told to me. And then he says this, Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. And so then he goes on to talk, talk about who saw him. But before I go any further, what does this mean? This is called an oral tradition. In fact, the oral tradition was such a big deal. This is how they passed down history. They, they didn't have computers like we do. They couldn't just go write a bunch of stuff down. They didn't have a bunch of scribes. There's a handful of them, but not a bunch. So how do you have history? They would, they would, they would have oral history. They would share it with one another. So he's like, hey, I'm telling you that Christ died and rose again. And if you don't believe me, go ask anybody in Jerusalem. They're still alive. People, people there, they saw it. He basically said, Google it. And they're like, yeah. You just walk around Jerusalem and you say, hey, excuse me, everyone real quick. Anyone ever see Jesus rise again? Yeah, I saw him. Yeah, I was there. I was, yeah, Bobby, you saw him. Yeah, and you saw him and Kool-Aid and Roro and y'all saw him. Well, like, yeah. Like they saw him. This was not news. I mean, they, they, they saw him rise again. And so did you know in the first century church, in the first century of Jerusalem, they would, had a saying, it was so common because it was an oral tradition because it was viral. They would say, he is risen. And then you would walk up, if you walked up to someone, you'd say, he is risen. And then they would say back to you, he is risen indeed. And so let's just practice that. It's an oral tradition say, he is risen. He is risen Come on, let's do it again. He is risen. He is risen Come on, Rodfield, he is risen. He is risen. Let's go, Stone Oak, he is risen. Come on, Podger Island, he is risen. risen. Let's go, Rockport, he is risen. risen. Come on, online, he is risen. risen. Everybody take your hands in the air. Oh, I'll stop, sorry. That's called an oral tradition. This was their version of going viral. This was more viral than Will Smith's slap. It went viral over the world because Christ rose again from the grave. It really happened. In fact, look what what Peter Williams said. He wrote this book called Can We Trust the Gospels? Can We Trust the Bible, basically? And he said this, it's hard to imagine belief in a risen Jesus getting very far if one could easily point to the grave in which he was still present. In other words, they could have shut this thing. If this thing was a hoax, they could have shut it down fast, drag his dead body out. They didn't have that because he was walking around talking to people. In fact, they even saw him. People are like, well, why are you still here? Well, because the, the, the disciples, the apostles, they actually saw him ascend to heaven too in Acts chapter one. They saw him do it. And so you just have to understand that there were too many eyewitnesses. Number three, would you write this down? There were over 500 eyewitnesses who interacted with Jesus after he rose again. People saw this happen. That's a crazy amount of people too. Oh, I think they all got together. They just made it up and everyone just kept their mouth shut. And we still talk about it today because we think it happened because they all lied. Okay, so Chuck Colson, Charles Colson was asked about this. Charles Colson was one of the top five guys that worked for President Nixon. During Watergate scandal, he's one of the top five guys that got in the room and said, hey, let's, um, let's break into the Democrat National Convention, let's get some stuff on them, and let's keep it quiet, right? That lasted, he said, for two weeks. Chuck Colson, he's a strong believer now. I think he's with the Lord, I believe. Is that right? I think he's already passed away. I think so. Anyways, but let me just say, is he still alive? I don't even know. Someone needs to tell me. I don't even know. Is he? You don't know? I don't even know. That's terrible. He wrote some great books. But he said this. He said there were five of us that were the closest people to President Nixon. He's five of the most powerful people in the world at the time. He said, we couldn't keep a secret for two weeks. But you're telling me 500 people kept a secret that they made up the resurrection for over two or three decades, and then 11 out of 12 disciples died for the lie. We couldn't keep a secret for five of us for two weeks. There is no way. Would you die for a lie? I wouldn't. So just imagine someone's coming at you with a sword and you made something up and you're like, we're going to kill you now because of your faith. I'd be like, whoa, 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 let's go easy now. We made that whole thing up. Sorry about that. Like if I wouldn't die for a lie. 
why was Peter the guy who denied Jesus three times all of a sudden the boldest guy on the planet and he was like, do what you want with me. I'm going to stand by my faith because I know my Savior rose again. Why was the Apostle Paul a murderer of Christians and now he's the greatest of the Christians saying, let's do this. Let's tell everyone about Jesus because I saw him face to face and his love blinded me and changed me from within. It changed everything. It changed everything, guys. 500 witnesses. We put someone behind bars for uh, their whole life with one witness. And there were 500 who witnessed Christ die and raise again to new life. Over 500 witnesses. Now you may say, Pastor, that's cool. I believe all that already. So we're all tuned into the same radio station. It's called WIIFM. What's in it for me? So the question is, why should I care? Why should I care that he rose again from the grave? Like, let's say I do believe that. Well, how does that make a difference for me? Here's how it makes a difference for you. Number four, Christ died and rose again to give you hope. You have hope. And if you hadn't gone through anything yet, you're going to one day need that hope. I just need to let you know right now. We all need some hope. Proverbs 13 says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Let's go back to our Easter egg for a basket, basket for a moment. You know, the truth is, is that we just start, you know, eating on the world. We're like, oh, I, I just want a great relationship. If I could just have a lot of money, man, and if I could just have some fame and people thought that was a big deal, <laughs> that'd be so cool. And so we just, we're just dousing on the world, man. We're just pigging out. We're like, yeah, oh, it's going to fulfill me. It's going to be so good. I can't wait. Just, I just stole God. I just want more. And what do you do as parents? You're like, whoa, 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 let's take that basket away. A little too much there. I don't want you to get sick. Because the truth is, is that when we start having everything the world has to offer, we finally, finally realize that it's really just a bunch of sugar and carbs. <laughs> and it won't satisfy you. You know why you need hope? Because at some point you're going to realize everything the world offers is just the same stuff year after year. Amen. And it will not satisfy your soul. Amen. You may have a great relationship. They may be awesome as a boyfriend, girlfriend, but they're a lousy Jesus. You may have the best job in the world, all the benefits, great career path, incredible income, great fame and opportunity and all that, but that doesn't satisfy your soul. Good. Jesus is our hope, right. and he's a lot more important than some carbs and some candy. Right. This is what the world's selling. It's not that good. Isn't it funny, too, by the way? Have you made a mess of your life lately? If we're honest with ourselves, what makes a mess of our life is when we just keep trying to get more of the world and wondering why it's not going to fulfill us. Now, it's good. It tastes good. I mean, sin's good. I mean, for a little while, it's like, yeah, it's pretty good. Man. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I mean, if you, if you haven't had fun while you're sinning, you don't know how to sin very well. I mean, I can teach you. It's not. <laughs> it's fun till it isn't. We've all been there too, haven't we? You're like, yeah, eventually the thing you thought was going to satisfy you just makes you sick. You know what? You can't get a, enough of something that won't satisfy. It's called the law of diminishing returns. I just get more of it, just more of it, more money. Then I'll be happy. More money, more stuff. I just have more. If I just have more, it doesn't do it. You need real hope. This last week, I, I called a friend of mine over Christmas. I had the honor of helping him bury his son. That's horrible. I, I, would, I don't wish that on anybody. And uh, I just called, I just felt led. I was just being his friend and his pastor, and I called him, just left a quick moist on. I just said, hey, I just want you to know something. I know it's your first Easter without your boy. I said, I just want you to know that because of what happened 2,000 years ago that we're celebrating this weekend, because of what happened 2,000 years ago, you'll see your boy again. That's our hope, isn't it? We'll see him again. He gives us hope. I want to read this, John 3, 16. Look what it says here. This is incredible. For God so loved the world. Let me personalize it. Can I do that? For God so loved you. This is crazy. God loves you so much. He says he gave his one and only son. He gave his only son. I got two sons. I have an heir and a spare. You know what I'm saying? I've got two. I'm not going to say which one's the heir or the spare. I'm not going to do that. I mean, well. <laughs> I mean, y'all know it's all going to Sophie anyways. Let's be honest. I mean, you already know that. Let's be honest. Okay. So, <laughs> but here's the deal. He gave his only son? What kind of crazy love is this that you give your child? It says, for, for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. It means you don't die. You, you, you don't 
separate from God for you don't go to hell. You have eternal life. That means heaven. But you have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So listen, today, I got good news to you. God's not trying to make you feel guilty for what you've already done. He's, he's trying to forgive you for what you already feel guilty about. He gives you a new start. He forgives you for all that, that you, you and I have, have done. And so it's hope that we need, and he is the hope giver. There is hope, and his name is Jesus. Look at the scripture. 1 Corinthians 2 says this. No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no mind has ever imagined the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. That means God has got some good plans for you. He is our hope. And the last thing I want to tell you is this. Not only is Christ your hope because he died and rose again, but number five, Christ died and rose again to give you help. Isn't that good to know that? Like some of you are like, okay, that's great, but like I need some help like today. Like I got some situations going on up in here. Like I need some help. God can help you. The scripture is very clear. It says in Philippians chapter three, it says that I may know him and the power of his, resurre of his resurrection. Let me tell you what that means. That means he doesn't want you to just know about his resurrection. He wants you to know his resurrection, like personally, like it's changing your life. So I don't know what you're facing today, but God wants to help you out. First Peter one says this, because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts when? Now. Now, now think about this for a second. Some people have a problem with this. You're like, there's two camps. The first camp is this. Yeah, when we die, you know, it's going to be amazing and glorious and awesome. And like, we're going to have this perfect heaven and, you know, we'll have new heavenly bodies. I'm looking forward to that. I need a new heavenly body. Anybody <laughs> else need that? I, I could really use that about now. And so we're going to have a new heavenly body. We're going to, no, there'll be no more, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. Like, this is a good day, right? Like, it's going to be great. And so some people are like, yeah, it's going to be great one day. The problem with that view is that means that 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 one day is like till you die. So it's kind of dystopian now, like everything else is gonna stink until then. So you can be real negative. You can be just real fearful and negative and like oh, everything's bad. And you know, oh, I'll, you know, oh, I love this person. Oh, just give it time, they're gonna hurt you. Oh, and then everything's gonna go bad. I know you probably gonna get fired one day from that job. I'm telling you everything's, gonna, and just everything's negative. Cause you think it's not gonna get good till we die. Then the other view, the opposite view is this. Oh no, the Bible says here, it says that you start today. In fact, Jesus said the kingdom of God is, with, is within us. It, it, it's, it's here with us. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm here and I'm gonna raise again. And the moment I raise again, kingdom begins. So what does that mean? That means that eternity, if you accept Christ, starts today. Now this is important to know because some people say, well, it starts when I die. No, it starts the day you accept Christ. That, that moment, it can start today for you. But here's the challenge. Some people say, yeah, because of that, that means I'll never get sick and it'll all be great and I'll never go, because God's here with me and whatever I'm facing, it'll all go good and everything will work out. And I'll, no, 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 not quite like that. And then guess what happens? You get really disappointed. I thought God was, was here and there's his new kingdom. And why, why did they have to die? And why did I have to go through divorce? And why did this happen to happen to me? And why was I abused? And all the people I had to go, and why did I deal with that? And why did they betray me? And why? I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought, you're, I thought you're making everything good. Jesus, you say you're making all things new. Well, can you make me new? I mean, I'm a mess. Jesus gives us a down payment on eternity when we get Christ in us, which means this, you, you have eternity in you once you receive Christ, but it's not a completely sealed deal it's a down payment on what you're going to fully get when you die. But that means he'll help you now, but we still have problems. Well, can't he just zap all the problems away? He can. He could just, he, he, all Jesus has to do is come back and boom, it's done. All good. All sins removed. We're all good. Here's the problem with that. All your friends and family that don't know him, they're done. They don't have a chance anymore. So in God's love and God's grace, he says the kingdom begins today, but not fully until I come back. And I'm waiting patiently, scripture says, because I want everyone to come to know me first. And so God is waiting. And so maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online or at one of our churches right now and you're not a Christian, you're still kind of trying to decide, could you hurry up? Because you really like to get this show on the road. Could you hurry up? Because <laughs> we're all waiting on you. Could you? But God loves you so much, he's waiting so that you have time to repent still. So I just want to encourage you, we have to live in the tension of kingdom starts now, but it's, it's not fully here yet. So just stay faithful. Does that make sense? but the kingdom does begin now, but he wants to give you help. You may want to pull your phones out right now. I want to show you something on the screens that you're going to want to take a picture of. I just, wanted, I just made a, a, a very incomplete list, but it's a list of just a few ways that Jesus will help you now. Maybe you're saying, man, I could really use some help. I, I, I'm going through a lot. Here's some ways God helps you now. Here's a few. Uh, with the stresses of life, God helps you. With the attacks of others, maybe someone's really messing with you and God says, I got you, I got you, I'm here for you. Um, how about guilt and shame? Maybe you, you're really embarrassed with some things you've done. 
Maybe your past seems to creep up on you. And you're like, man, I just hate who I used to be. God can forgive you. Well, he does. He completely removes that from you. And so honestly, finding Christ just alone, just for your guilt and shame is worth it. Like even without eternity, just like, man, just, whew, just a fresh start. That's incredible, right? How about this? Um, overwhelming problems. Christ wants to help you with that. Unforgiveness. Maybe there's, there's someone who's really wounded you, someone really hurt you and you're really having a hard time forgiving him. In fact, next week we're starting a brand new series on that. It's called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. I wanna encourage you to be here for that series. It's just a two-weeker. It's gonna be really powerful though. And if there's someone, maybe you're like, yeah, pastor, as soon as I forgive them, then they open their mouth again. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Don't point at them across the room. I mean, I don't, you know, don't embarrass them. I'm just saying. How do you deal with someone who doesn't get it? They're still offending you. Like they're still hurting you. How do you deal with that? Be here next week as we talk about that. How do you forgive what you can't forget? Or maybe something really bad happened to you, and you're like, can you just get up there, Pastor? You talk about just forgiving people and moving forward. I can't just do that. I get it. Next week is for you. Don't miss next week forgiving what you can't forget. How about this one, the, the fear of death? Look, I can honestly tell you guys, because of my relationship with Christ, I don't fear death. It doesn't mean that I want to risk my life every moment, and I don't fear death, so let's go crazy. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not looking forward to the actual moment I die, like my heart stops, and I'm like, Ugh! I'm not looking forward to that moment. But I know like a second after that, I'm with the Lord. Like, so I'm not afraid of dying. And a lot of people were freaking out during COVID, not necessarily because of death, but because of what they don't think is after death. But I'm, I'm not afraid of that. Like, you don't have to fear death once you have Christ. How about this one? The, the judgment of hell. You don't have to fear that because God saves you from that. How about, how, let's get real practical. How about financial problems? How about financial problems, right? I'll wait. It's okay. God wants to help you financial problems. Let's get practical for a second. Can I do that for a second? You're like, man, that sounds all great, Pastor, but I can't pay the bills, you know? And God says, I got you. So I just want to be practical. Overwhelming problems, financial problems. How about emotional problems? Maybe you're dealing with, with depression. Maybe you're really struggling with anxiety. He says, I got you. You don't have to live with this cloud over you for the rest of your life. I've got you. And here's my favorite one, traps I don't see coming. You know what that means? Some people are like, oh, I just know something bad's gonna happen to me tomorrow. God's like, I know what's coming and I got you. Amen. Yes. You don't have to live in fear. God has you. Amen. Isn't that good to know that? You don't, have to, you don't have to be afraid. He can be trusted. He really can. I want to show you a few quick last pictures and we're done. Because sometimes people tell me, yeah, but isn't Christianity like all of the world religions? No, it's not. Not even close. In fact, all other world religions talk about like do this and do that and you'll be on your way to being good and maybe get into some kind of heaven or something. But Christianity's not spelled do this or do that. It's spelled D-O-N-E, done. He did it for you at the cross. All you have to do is receive him, right? But let me just show you something real quick. Let's talk about all of the world religions for a moment. Just going to give you three of the top ones. There's lots of ones, but check out this picture. This is a picture of Buddha. This is where his burial ground is. You can see he's still in the ground. Can you see it right there? See his little, <laughs> see he's still got him? See that? But that's where he was buried, right? He's still there. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just saying he's still there, okay? Here's, here's Mohammed's grave. It's quite the grave, by the way. That's, that's a serious grave. And, uh, but again, you know, he, he, he's still there. Okay, um, and here, how about Confucius' grave? That, that's Confucius' grave. The next one is Confucius. That's his grave, still there. Confucianism, by the way, is more of a philosophy than a religion. And I think that's important because people, if you talk to someone who's into Confucian, they'll say, oh, it's a philosophy, not a religion, which is funny because think about all the people who are really into philosophy. You go to any college campus right now, you want to see a religion, just go listen to them. It's a religion now, man. I mean, just, they just don't want to admit it, but it, it's a religion, it's dogma. And they will cancel you and shut you down if you don't agree with their viewpoints so fast. That's, that's a religion. So let's just admit it. The religion most of them are worshiping is their mind. Oh, I know the best way. And you don't, you're just horrible, you're terrible, you don't agree with me. Become a religion. I just need to let you know that all founders of these religions are, they're still there in their graves. But our founder is not in his grave. He has been risen. He's, he's arisen, and he's risen indeed. You know, on that Friday when he died, this last thing I'll say, and we'll wrap it up. On that Friday when he died, there was a letter that was written later about this by a guy, a guy named Julian Africanus, if you want to look it up. 
He wrote to a friend and he said, I wonder why it went dark at noon. Did you know it went dark at noon? And he said, I wonder why it went dark at noon. And then in the letter, they were trying to describe why they think, what, maybe it was an eclipse. Maybe it was just a really bad storm that, that, that happened to happen at noon. But no one in the letter questioned whether it went dark at noon the day Christ died. They just, it was a fact. Everyone was there like, yeah, we all were there. We saw it happen. I love the evidence that that is that, that, uh, to the whole event that he died and rose again for us that Friday. It went dark. Mel Gibson in The Passion of Christ uh, showed it as a storm. It could have been that. I mean, it could have been clouds just so thick. I, to me, it, it, I feel like it would have been a storm because it would have been like God crying that he lost his son. It also could have been an eclipse, which I could see God doing that too, saying, you know, my son who shines bright is, has been eclipsed, has been cut off because of death. There's, there's lots of ways to interpret it, but I will tell you this, what no one doubted was that he, he, he died for our sins and he rose again. But let me ask you this one question. Are you in a dark spot? Are you in a dark place in your marriage? A dark place in your family? Are you in a dark place personally? Have some decisions that you've made kind of made a, a bit of a mess? Are you in a dark spot? I got some good news for you today. Even if you're in a dark spot, Sunday is coming. Your Sunday is coming. I believe that. And if Christ got up again, so can you. You can get up again too. You're not done. Would you bow your heads with me, every head bowed, every eye closed, and we take a moment to pray. Is God speaking to you today? I believe he is. He may be saying to you, hey, waiting on you, man. I want you to accept my son. You can receive him right now by praying a very simple prayer. Would you pray this prayer with us? You can just say it out loud together across all of our churches. You can say it with us online. Just say, dear, dear Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you paid the price for my sins. And I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I repent of my sins. I put you in first place. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you just gave your life to Christ, no one's looking around. No one's looking around. Would you just lift your hand high? If you just gave your life to Jesus, no one's looking around. Just lift your hand high. If you just gave your life to Christ, thank you. There are hands going up all across our churches right now. Thank you. We see those hands. Thank you, Stone Oak. Praise God. Thank you, Rodfield. Just lift your hand high. If you just gave your life to Christ, thank you, Rockport. Praise God. Thank you, Padre. Hold your hand high online. You can let us know online right now by putting it in the text chat. Just text my hands raised. Just let us know right now. You can click hand raised right now. Your church unlimited.com. Thank you for giving your life to Christ today. You're not alone. God, thank you for the many people who gave their lives to you today. Thank you, God, for your word. And thank you, Lord, that you really did send your son to die for all our sins. You died and you rose again. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true. Thank you for watching the Church Unlimited YouTube channel. But don't stop now. Join our online family so you can stay connected with what God is doing here. Subscribe to this channel and hit the bell so that you never miss a service. And don't forget to share with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to impact lives around the world. Thank you for watching and God bless.